Let's get into today's message. There we go. We're in Luke chapter 12. Um, last week we were talking about where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We're in that same sort of discourse of Jesus. Uh, there's a lot of verses here, but it really has pretty much a central message. So let's get into it. <coughs> Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning, and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at the table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second or in the third watch and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. And again, the, the uh, Jews of the first century had three watches of the night, so the third one would be the, the wee hours of the morning. And uh, if they were vigilant till then, they were blessed. But know this, if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. I always laugh when people say, we know when Jesus is coming. <coughs> that, the Bible says, no, you don't. Okay, so just, just keep that straight. Uh, Peter said, Lord, um, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager? whom his master will set over his household to give them the portion of the food at the proper time. Blessed is the servant whom his master will find him doing so when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him to pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him who is, whom they trust much, they will demand the more. A lot of very intriguing texts in here, but let's get into it. Ready for action. He starts out by telling them to stay dressed for action. In some versions it says gird up your loins. That just means you're, you're ready for activity. You're ready to fight or to travel or do something. Uh, that requires freedom of movement, but you need to be ready. Keep your lamps burning. Be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. You know, so much of the biblical text came alive to me just, just working in Africa. In East Africa, um, they don't, you know, some people wear watches, but it doesn't really mean much. Um, you, you, you know, I remember one time I told people I was going to come out to visit them, and, and I said, I'll probably be there around 2, and then I said, no, wait, it's probably going to be more like 2.30, and they all started laughing. And I said, well, what's so funny? And they said, Jolie, tell us if you're coming in the morning or in the afternoon. <laughs> That's all that matters. And, and what I discovered was you're not coming until you show up. So I would get there, and then whenever I got there, then they would send people out to gather the crowd for us to start preaching, which would mean another two or three hours. Uh, time is a whole different world in a third world situation, and it was very much so in the first century. So when it talks about staying dressed for action, you know, when, if they knew the day you were coming, that was good. But boy, you had no idea when exactly that was going to be. And so this idea of staying ready, staying, you know, dressed, staying ready for action uh, was, was really, really important. 
Um, and, and so this idea of are you diligent? Are you a good servant? You know, what Jesus is talking about here is you can't be a part-time Christian. Now, I know a lot of people try. But the fact of the matter is he's saying, look, as a servant of Christ, as someone who works for God, you can't do that part-time. There's no time, you know, you think, well, well, you know, maybe the boss isn't watching. See, God is always watching. He's always there. And this idea that, that if you want to serve God, that is not, that's a lifestyle. That's not an occupation that you get off and start back on the next day. And, 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 and Jesus is trying to get this across. He's talked about it, you know, how to handle your money, where your, where your treasure is, there your heart's going to be also. And now he's saying, now, now what you do with it, how you act, how you behave, because part-time Christianity just isn't going to be acceptable. Blessed are those who are vigilant. If he comes in the second watch or the third and finds them awake, blessed are they. Those people who are truly live their lives as Christians. And if you've ever been in an employee or employer situation where you've had workers... When I was at Pepperdine, before we went to Kenya, I worked in the audiovisual department. I had 16 student workers. Now, when you have 16 student workers, you find out that there are some really good workers, and then there's a whole bunch that are there to do their homework while they're at work. Um, and there were people I could rely on and people that I couldn't rely on. Uh, there were those who were just always ready, and there were those that were never ready. You know, I'd just call their name, and it'd be... <sighs> We're paying you to work here, you know, but uh, they, you know, and others were just always, hey, what do you need? What can I do for you? What, you know, and, and, and boy, that makes a huge difference. And, and now the problem with that is you tend to rely on those you can and, and let the lazy ones be lazy. At the same time, when the guys you relied on all the time needed some days off, I was very happy to give it to them. You sort of just treat them a little better because you know you can count on them. And, and, and this is this idea of the, the are you going to be a Christian who's reliable? Are you going to be a Christian that God can count on? Because we can certainly count on him. Are, are we going to be, be someone who's always ready to work for the Lord? Or not? Are you ready? Jesus is looking for people that are fully committed. Jesus is looking for disciples, you know, this is always what's fascinated me. In this, in this day and age of mega churches, I find it fascinating that Jesus always seemed to be trying to cut down on the crowd that was following him instead of increases. And I don't think Jesus is against numbers. I think he's just more for quality. And he kept trying to get that across to those who were following that this is a serious commitment, that this is an all-in commitment, that this isn't a part-time thing. I need people that I can count on because it's going to get tough. There will be persecution. There will be hard times. There will be rough roads. And that was one of the most important things about us when we went to Kenya is, was knowing and again, I know that in Churches of Christ, I wasn't raised with talk about calling. But I've become a very firm believer in calling. Because knowing God had called us is what helped us survive the tough times. It's what kept us going in the tough times. When, when, it, when things would get really rough and when things were, were it was just so tempting to leave. We could, we, would, we, we could get together and, and, and we would know we're here because God put us here. And if God put us here, he can keep us here as long as he needs us to. And I remember when, when one of my opponents came and said, we're going to throw you out. He was upset because I wouldn't uh, pay him a salary. He said, if you don't pay me, we're going to throw you out. And I was able to very calmly say, you know, I came here because God brought me here. And I'll leave when God tells me to. 
That's, it's critical to know that. We're called by God, but if we've got to be all in, not halfway in. And I saw missionaries like that. They, they came over, they were excited, they were, it was an emotional call, they, they got in and involved, and I don't know what happened, but within a year they were, they were having to go home. They didn't, they just weren't ready for the culture shock and for the third world living and, and all sorts of other issues. And they just, they, you could tell that their, their, their commitment wasn't solid. And for whatever reason, within a year or so, they had to go home. We're supposed to be Christians, even when no one's looking, because the fact of the matter is, if you serve God, you're never out of his sight. That's the good news, and that's the bad news, depending on what you're up to. But know this, if the master, had known the, uh, the master of the house had known the hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You ever had that, and you ever had your house broken into, and you thought, boy, I wish I had just been standing there behind the door with a baseball bat or something. I don't, you know, you have those feelings, like if I had known, well, that's the problem. And Jesus is using that very apt illustration to make a point. But what is the point? Is he sort of presenting himself as a guy who's, who's going to just, you know, surprise you, surprise inspection? If you're ever in the military or, or in some office where the boss just like to drop in and be surprise everybody, and it was just a, an I gotcha kind of moment, is Jesus presenting himself as that kind of a guy? That, you know, you want to know when he's coming? He's going to surprise. I always loved, there was an old commercial. This would have been ancient, you know, back in like the 80s or something. But uh, it, it was one of those where I think it was an aftershave commercial where it says, does your aftershave arrive five minutes before you do? And it shows everyone in this office with their feet kicked up and doing their nails and, and you know, just, just not doing what they were supposed to be doing. And then someone says... <gasps> he's coming. And, you know, they all just go feverishly to work on the phones. The whole office lights up. Everyone's so busy. And the guy walks in. He's like, everyone seems so busy, but nothing ever seems to get done around here. And then finally he, you know, of course, changes to the right aftershave and walks in and catches them all laying around. But that's, is that what's going on here? Is this, you know, you finally figure out a way to sneak up on people? I don't, I don't see... God that way. This idea that he's going to sneak up on us. What he's saying is live a lifestyle prepared. You see, if you're just a good worker, you don't have to worry about the boss surprising you. And I, I learned that growing up. And, and you, you just, if this is just the way you work, then you don't have to worry about the drop-in boss or the surprise inspection or, or anything like that. You just do your job. And when you do your job, even when you think no one's watching, people are watching. It's amazing how observant people are and how they will back you up. You know, I, I remember one morning I had a doctor's appointment. I showed up and someone was waiting outside my office. And they said, hey, you preachers are always coming in here late, you know, sleeping in, you know, just, just giving me a hard time. But there were several others around there. Hey, man, his bike's out here at 7.30 every morning. Don't give, you know, they were, they were really quick to straighten that out. I, people notice. You do your job right and you don't have to worry. But if you don't do your job right, you're constantly worried. Now, which way do you want to live? I mean, think about that. You think about a whole lifestyle of, I've got to always be careful so that I know when to act busy so I don't get surprised by the boss. I mean, the stress, as opposed to, you know, if I just do my job, if I'm just faithful, You know, I, I mean, in your marriage, in any relationship, if you're just faithful all the time, you don't have to worry about it. It's the ones that are sneaking around. It's the ones that are saying one thing to your face and another behind your back. Boy, they got to always remember. 
You know, it's, it talks about people that like to lie a lot. They've got to have an incredible memory because they can't remember all the lies they've told. Do you, do you, if you're just honest, you don't have to worry about it. So what Jesus is telling his people, he's saying, look, live your life consistently. Live your life faithfully. And then you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to live in constant stress. You don't have to remember who you told what. You don't have to, to get creative about where you were when you weren't. Just live a faithful life. And when God shows up, you'll be doing what you're always doing. Blessed are those servants who were awake because that's just who they are. It's a lifestyle versus just trying to look good. And I know we, we have that, there's that human thing that tries to look good. And, you know, I find the, you know, one of the nice things about getting older is that I've just given up trying. You know, you, I look in the mirror every morning. The only good news is my eyesight's getting worse, so I look better all the time. But <laughs> you can't just fake God out. And we have, you know, I've joked about the church bubble. You see a couple coming in, and you can tell they're fighting in the car, but as soon as they get out, everything's great. Beautiful day. And we all have that thing that's trying, but the fact is, look, look we're weak, selfish centers. We're messed up people. And I remember so I, I said that to a colleague once. I said, sounds like a personal problem. Said, oh, you're saying I'm flawed and broken? I said, yeah, just like the rest of us. Let's just get past that, can we? This idea that I'm better than somebody else or that I'm pretty good? You see, if we don't recognize our sinfulness, we don't appreciate God's grace. And, and, and it's the gratitude for the grace that motivates us for the consistency and the faithfulness. When I realize that God is willing to overlook my sins, God is willing to erase them with the blood of Jesus Christ. I am highly motivated to make him as proud of me as I can. I want, I'm motivated to make the boss look good. And that's not because he's going to pay me more. That's because I just want to make him, I want to show him I appreciate everything he's done for me. It's a lifestyle. It's not about putting on a show like so many people do. Christian faith, it's all inclusive. I, I get a kick out of this, and several of the commentaries I read were had some interesting remarks about this, but right in the middle of this discourse, you sort of forget there's a crowd that's following Jesus, and there's his 12 disciples. And Jesus is obviously talking to one group or the other, but the others are listening in, obviously. And so as, as he goes through this, all of a sudden Peter just jumps in and says, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for everybody? I don't know if you remember, but Jesus just goes on with his lesson. I mean, he doesn't really answer Peter's question, which is, which is an answer. It's sort of like, is this for us or for them? And Jesus says, yes. I'm talking about staying faithful, staying ready, being, being vigilant. I'm talking to everybody who claims to have a relationship with God. Leaders, followers, elders, deacons, seat warmers, whoever. That we're all called to the same faithfulness, same vigilance. Now there's an interesting twist on this though. See, we're all called to the same commitment according to the gifts that God has given us. Which means your faithfulness and my faithfulness might look a little different. We're called to be faithful in, according to what God has given us. Now, at a very early age, my parents realized that I had an incredible gift of talking constantly. In fact, my mother said she always knew when I was doing something I shouldn't because I was quiet. The only time I was quiet. 
She says, I came out of the womb talking. And God decided to put that gift of mine to use. That's what I do. And so he had me learn the Bible so I could talk about things worth talking about. Thank you, Norm. But each one of us has been given different gifts. And, you know, if we all talked like I do, no one would hear anything. You know, we, we do, they're, they're, you got different gifts, different gifts of service, of giving, of sharing, of, of encouraging. And it's when we put those gifts together. Someone asked me once, do you think, you know, we're supposed to be reflections of God. And I said, I don't think any one person can reflect God adequately. In fact, I think that's why he calls us to be a church. Because all of us put together possibly can reflect God in a good way, in a more complete way. I think that's why God has us get married. It says he made men and women in his image, male and female. And that unless you, you, you have a men and women involved, you don't get a complete picture of God. But there, even there, I don't think any couple can fully reflect God. I think it takes a whole lot of couples. It takes a whole lot of male and female to reflect God. And that's why he calls us together. I think that's why he has multiple, uh, what we call collective leadership and elders. Because when you look at, at the requirements of elders and what elders are supposed to do, I don't think any one elder can. But as a group, as a collection of all of our gifts, when the leadership comes together, if we put our gifts together, then we can reflect God in a more clear way that we actually need each other and that we shouldn't see any differences in our callings to be at odds with each other, that we're actually helping the whole. So we all have the same commitment. Though. We're all supposed to be completely committed. But you're supposed to be committed using the gifts God gave you, and I'm going to be committed using the gifts God gave me. And when we put that together, we start to reflect. Probably still a little blurred, but we start to reflect the image of God. The faith of the unfaithful, and here's, uh, you know, that come up. And there's a lot of movies like this, you know, where the person, you know, tries to do all sorts of stuff and gets away from behind the back and does bad things, but in the end. And that's what he says here. If that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming, and he begins to beat the male and female servants to eat, drink, and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on the day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he does not know. And he will cut him to pieces and put him with the unfaithful. I always thought that was interesting. You know, I would think cutting to pieces would sort of do it. But then he'll put you with the unfaithful. That sort of implies the life after death heart. And that the, when the master comes and finds an unfaithful servant, when he, when he catches people claiming to be his followers, but being unfaithful, that, that's, that's not going to be good. Uh, or this would be where you'd pull in that woe statement. Woe to those who are unfaithful. It's going to be bad. You don't want to go there. Those who try to fool the boss end up being the fool. And that's a very consistent biblical message from Genesis to Revelation. I've always been, you, you read through the scriptures and you find out how many people actually knew God and knew God's will and tried to work against it. And, you know, I, th I think of King Saul. He knows. Samuel told him, God's going to take the king away from you going to give it to someone close to you. He knew it was David. And so he kept trying to kill David. I'm going to mess up the creator of the universe's plans. Does this sound right to you? That's what this is talking about. We're talking about God. We can't fool God. There, there's, you know... I don't know how many people have this idea. You know, when they come to church, God's watching, but when you're at home, he's not. 
Or maybe whatever you're watching on TV after 10 p.m., God went to sleep. And so he's not watching what we're watching. Or he's not on your computer with you. Or anything else. We have this idea that there's places where God is and places where God isn't. And I, I as a preacher of the word, God is. And in fact, if you agree, and I, I typically agree with this uh, theological premise, there's only one place God isn't. And the Bible calls that hell. That if, if we spend our lives letting God know we don't want to have anything to do with him, then when we die, he will let us go to the place where he is not. And that place is hell. And that's what this is talking about. If you aren't faithful, if you know God and don't do his will, he'll let you. I've always said that's one of the scariest things about God. If you don't want to obey him, he'll let you and see what life is like. Because life is only found in him. Now here we get to a really interesting passage. One that, uh, well, I, I didn't have time to read all of the commentaries about this kind of thing. This is, a, this is a little bit confusing. And the servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. Here's the tricky part. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. It sounds like there's varying degrees of punishment. And how literally are we to take this? How much theology? Is this talking about the afterlife? Is this talking about this life? And believe me, I've read everything and every which angle. Uh, this is one of those passages that even theologians struggle with. There seems to be varying degrees of punishment or uh, of root. Excuse me, reward. So, as our varying, you know, uh, when we get to heaven, we talk about, you know, will you get a bigger mansion or a little mansion, or will you just be the pool boy in heaven? I'll be fine with that, you know. And and then, uh, but but is is there is there varying degrees of hell? Is there like, you know, hell and then the bad neighborhood in hell? I, you know, we don't know. We don't know. But this implies that God's punishment will be just. And I appreciate that. That if someone knows God's will, and we get this right, if you've had kids, you know, if you specifically told them not to do something and they did it anyway, that's going to be bad. But if they did something they shouldn't have, but you hadn't specifically spelled that out, it's a little different. Basically, as or as you know, the echoing voice of my mother is always, "You knew better," and we've all heard that, right? You knew better. I say, "What well, Fred did it, but you knew better." Well, my mother's favorite. His last name's not Jolliffe. You knew better. That's what this is talking about. That God is a God of justice, even in punishment. Conclusion, and here's the really scary one. <clears throat> it's also a really good one. Everyone to whom much has been given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. In other words, some folks have been given a lot. Some folks have been given a little. And how that all works out and how God makes those decisions, I don't know. We can ask God when we get there. But the fact is, some people have some what I consider incredible talents. And some people don't seem to have much. You know, I, I've been out in a village in northern Kenya that doesn't even show up on the map. And there's some guys there, Juma, ever went to school in his life, worked his farm as best he could, was into witchcraft most of his life. He became a Christian. He can't read. But he heard 
the gospel and he became a Christian. And he died not long after. Little village outside of Mpwapa. Can he get to heaven? What do you think? Of course! He didn't have a lot. But he heard the message. And he was faithful. When he died. He can get to heaven from there. Now some of us have been raised and educated. Some of us have been given lots of talent. Can we get to heaven from Simi Valley? Absolutely. The key is, he has been given much. Much will be required. And the question is, are we faithful? I mean, that's the issue. It's not how well did we do everything. It's not how perfect we were. It's not the the perfect, I, I hate to break it to you guys that have been born and raised in the Church of the Christ, it's not the perfect attendance button. I was reminded in class that I needed to, you know, give stars to everybody that showed up to class on time. You know, that, uh, that we have this, we, we, we sort of raised with this culture that, you know, you get extra points. And somehow, you know, then, then you start getting extra points and you think, well, I can cash in a few. It's almost like cash back, you know. I've been so good, I can do a little sinning and I'm still good. And it doesn't work that way. It's about being consistently faithful. And here's one of the most important things I've learned in my spiritual walk. I can't be perfect. It is not possible. But I can be faithful. I can't be a perfect husband. But I have been faithful. I can't be a perfect dad. But I have been. I can't be a perfect Christian. I was baptized at 11, and like Dan said, I knew enough, and I've been faithful. I mess up, not perfect, but consistently faithful. That's what what is required of us. It's a principle we all need to understand. Your job is not to be better than me. I just want to be really clear. When you get to heaven, when they say, why should we let you in? You can't say, I was better than Daniel. (laughs) That won't get you there. In fact, it's important that we don't say, I was better than anyone else, because that has nothing to do with it. If you understand this, being better than someone else has absolutely nothing to do with it. It has to do with your consistent relationship with God based on what he has given you. I baptize more people than so-and-so. That doesn't matter. I was a better Bible school teacher. That doesn't matter. I've been going to church all my... That doesn't matter. What have you done? What have I done with what God has given me? That's, That's what we're going to be judged on. Are we consistently faithful with what God has given us? See, God's expectations of each one of us is directly related to all the gifts and talents and resources that he's given us. It doesn't matter what he's given somebody else. It's about what he's given to you and to me. To he who has been given much much will be expected. And I can tell you, as someone who's traveled around the world, just living here, we've been given a lot. And a lot will be expected. If you have any needs this morning, please come as we stand and sing.